Hi, I'm Caleb, and you're listening to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcast. Welcome to the University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. My name is Sadant Wadera, and I am the production manager for The Main Page, our podcast on policy, politics, and current affairs. Today, we have the second installment of a miniseries on the Supreme Court, democracy, and election law. You'll hear Andrew Wise interview Slate journalist Mark Joseph Stern about the ideological underpinnings of the Supreme Court and the federal judiciary. Three quick notes before we begin. First, this episode was recorded remotely due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Second, we re-recorded some of Andrew's questions for clarity. Finally, this interview was conducted before Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, so we don't fully touch upon the future of the court. Without further ado, here's Slate journalist Mark Joseph Stir. <laughs> Hello, I am Andrew Wise with the UC3P main page mini-series about both the U.S. Supreme Court, election law, and democracy. We are excited to be joined today by Mark Joseph Stern, a writer who for Slate who focuses on issues of law and justice and published a book last year entitled American Justice 2019, The Roberts Court Arrives. Mr. Stern, thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me on. You're welcome. That's an interesting choice of title, The Roberts Court Arrives. At the time of publication, John Roberts had already been the Chief Justice for 14 terms. Can you talk a little about in what sense the Roberts Court has arrived, and how did Kennedy's departure change the court? Yeah, so when we talk about the Roberts Court, we're talking about two different things. On the one hand, it's a convenient shorthand to describe the current Supreme Court. The Chief Justice is John Roberts, so it's the Roberts Court. In the past, we've talked about the Rehnquist Court, the Berger Court, the Warren Court. But in another sense, when you talk about the Roberts Court, you're you're sort of talking about the court that John Roberts controls, the one that almost bears his name. When we talk about decisions by the Warren Court in the 1960s, we're not just saying, oh, that was who happened to be Chief Justice. We're talking about how Chief Justice Warren imbued the court with his own view of the law and jurisprudence, right? Chief Justice Roberts didn't really get a chance to make the Supreme Court his, to imbue the court with his own personal uh, and, and jurisprudential views until Justice Anthony Kennedy stepped down in 2018. Jo- when John Roberts joined the court Justice Kennedy was the swing vote, and he remained the swing vote through his entire tenure. If there was a closely divided five to four decision, you could bet that Justice Kennedy was going to be in the majority. In fact, he would cast the fifth vote. Uh, And so even though John Roberts definitely wrote some very important opinions when Kennedy was serving alongside him, very consequential decisions, and certainly, uh, you know, explained his own views about the law and sometimes put them into words and action, it was still the Kennedy court. Every single term, a few major cases came down to Anthony Kennedy. After Kennedy retired, that all changed. John Roberts became the swing justice, which means he is the most moderate of the five conservatives and the one most willing to occasionally join the four liberal justices. So when I said the Roberts Court arrives, what I meant was this is no longer a court bearing Roberts' name but controlled by Anthony Kennedy. This is at long last a court that bears Roberts' name and is actually under the control of Chief Justice John Roberts. And that remains, of course, the situation today. Yes, indeed. And John Roberts has sometimes voted against the interests of the Trump administration, such as when he voted against adding the citizenship question to the census on procedural grounds. But 
is it fair to say that his rulings in favor of the Trump administration and in favor of the Republican Party more broadly will be more consequential and more impactful? Uh, I think it's too soon to tell. You know, in terms of chief justices, Roberts hasn't actually been there for that long, right? He's been there for about 15 years now. He's probably got at least another 15 years left in him. So he's still got plenty of time to uh, decide where he wants to bring the court and how he wants to use the court's limited political capital. I would say right now, the decisions in which John Roberts joins with his fellow conservatives have been more consequential. To give one example, Shelby County versus Holder, which was a decision in 2013 that uh, really gutted a key part of the Voting Rights Act uh, that required historically racist states to get federal approval before changing their election laws. That decision is one of the most consequential of all time. I I mean, it allowed a huge number of jurisdictions to begin implementing a a lot of measures that critics, including me, just decry as voter suppression, voter ID laws, uh, in many cases, racial gerrymandering, a raft of poll closures in largely minority neighborhoods. Uh, John Roberts' decision in Shelby County, which was five to four, basically gave the states free reign to start actively suppressing minority votes. Similarly, in Citizens United, John Roberts cast that fifth vote, gutting federal campaign finance reform and ushering in the era of super PACs. So if you compare cases like Shelby County and Citizens United to a case like the census citizenship question, there's really no, there's really no debate about which ones have the bigger impact. The census citizenship question would have been terrible. I think it would have been awful, and I'm very glad Roberts ruled the way he did. But that decision just does not have the massive ramifications of, of another kind of conservative ruling like Shelby County. I am interested in your comments on a more recent case that's problematic for voting rights. The Supreme Court ruled last year, five to four, in Rucho v. Common Cause to kick partisan gerrymandering in lawsuits out of federal courts, saying that it is a political question and the federal courts have no jurisdiction over that. This was a strictly partisan decision with Roberts and his fellow Republican appointees outvoting the Democratic appointees. Can you talk about this ruling and why it is so problematic for fair elections and democracy? Yeah, so Rucho v. Common Cause, the partisan gerrymandering case, is a a terrific example of how Justice Kennedy's retirement changed the court. For many, many years, Justice Kennedy refused to cast the fifth vote that would have declared partisan gerrymandering to be a political question that federal courts just can't deal with. He wrote that he was concerned about uh, the way that partisan gerrymandering infringes upon freedom of expression and freedom of association, about how partisan gerrymandering essentially involves lawmakers dividing up citizens on the basis of partisan lines and then trying to dilute the votes of people who support a particular party. That seems like a real threat to freedom of speech. It means if you express your views for a certain party, that you will be punished by the state. Um, And so Kennedy was not willing to throw those cases out of court. He retires. He is replaced by Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And Kavanaugh just very quickly sides with the other four conservatives to put this matter to bed altogether and cast that fifth vote with Chief Justice Roberts to say, we're not going to deal with partisan gerrymandering. That's not our issue. That was a hugely problematic decision for voting rights, as Justice Elena Kagan wrote quite eloquently in her dissent, because partisan gerrymandering has become a a true art uh, and really also a science in the sense that you can use technology, software that is not even that expensive or hard to get and input a bunch of data, uh, much of which is public record, and figure out how to maximize partisan advantage for your party and really entrench your power over a state legislature or or a congressional delegation, even if the majority of statewide voters don't support you. In fact, even if the majority of voters really reject your party and seem to reject everything your party stands for and your party's candidates, if you draw that gerrymander correctly, your party can stay in power. And that just seems to go totally against what free and fair elections are supposed to be about. Just as Kagan wrote that election day is sacred in democracy, it's when 
We choose the people who will govern us. But with partisan gerrymandering, uh, we are not choosing our lawmakers. Our lawmakers are choosing their voters. And that just seems to get it totally backwards. So Rucho was a devastating decision. It was followed up by a lot of state level litigation because state courts are still free to limit partisan gerrymandering under state constitutions. Rucho only involved the federal constitution. So not all is lost here. There are still avenues for reform, but there was hope that the Supreme Court would provide a sort of holy grail ruling that just wiped out partisan gerrymandering. And obviously that did not happen. Indeed. And one instance would be a state like Wisconsin, where the state legislature is so gerrymandered that even though Democrats won the popular vote by, I think, eight points in 2018, they still won barely more than a third of the state legislative seats. And um, that is not really what I would describe as a free and fair election. That sounds much more like an election that was rigged for the ruling party ahead of time. Um, a point that Justice Kagan makes that Chief Justice Roberts really sort of just pushes away in in his opinion and says, I am more concerned about the politicization of federal courts than I am about protecting voting rights. Yes, that seems about right. Interesting to note there is that North Carolina has seen similar issues, but North Carolina's state courts are majority Democratic, while Wisconsin's are majority Republican, and so cases under state law have come out differently. For instance, the North Carolina state court ordered the U.S. House map redrawn. Yes, that's correct, Uh, as well as legislative maps. We often forget about this, but all 50 states have their own state constitutions. um, And all 50 state constitutions have either a guarantee of free and fair or free and equal elections, an explicit guarantee of the right to vote, or both. I think we've all come to learn that the federal constitution does not contain an explicit guarantee of the right to vote. And that's why so many civil rights litigants are going to the state courts and trying to file lawsuits under state constitutions because they can mount these very strong arguments that are rooted in state constitutional guarantees of of free elections and truly equal suffrage among all citizens. You recently wrote an article for Slate addressing an opinion by a conservative appellate court judge, George W. Bush appointee Bill Pryor, that called for greatly expanding the holding in Rucho. Could you talk about what Judge Pryor argued in his decision and what the implications would be if his reasoning ever became the law of the land? Yeah, so remember in in Rucho, the partisan gerrymandering case, the court said, look, we're federal judges, we're not politicians, we're not data scientists, we're not map makers, we're not going to step in here and govern how these districts are drawn when it comes to partisanship. And that's called the political question doctrine. The opinion was very clearly limited, in my view, to the issue of gerrymandering. But Judge Pryor, who is one of the most conservative judges uh, on the federal courts of appeals, issued a a solo decision recently. He was only speaking for himself, uh, in which he argued that the holding of Rucho should apply much more broadly, that uh, matters of election law in general, so uh, voting hours, absentee voting days, whether touchscreens or paper ballots are used in the time of COVID. What, uh, what health protocols are undertaken, that all of those issues are also political questions and that plaintiffs cannot come into court and argue that, say, a state is making it more difficult for them to vote by reducing hours and uh, closing precincts and whatever states do to try to make it hard to vote, because those are all political judgment calls. They aren't constitutional judgment calls. And so judges should just sort of butt out and let states run elections as they see fit. Obviously, if the Supreme Court ever adopted that logic, it would really, I think, uh, it would really harm the constitutional right uh, to participate in elections, to cast a ballot, to associate with fellow voters, to support candidates. It would mean that you, there would be no more constitutional protections in reality for those activities 
because if you felt that your rights were being abridged and you went to court and said, hey, I need my 